Happy Sabbath to each of you. And uh, I'd like to thank the church that they were willing to bring me here. It's only by the grace of God that I am here. Amen. <laughs> um, I'm just thankful that I can worship with like minded believers in Washington State. And I'm thankful that God has given me that ability to, to share his word this morning. I'd like to turn to a scripture that I think you're, you might be familiar with. And so why don't we do that so that we can go into our study lesson this, this morning. Because this is a Sabbath school, isn't it? Amen. Amen. All right, go with me to Lamentations chapter 3. Uh, this is one that you're familiar with. Where is Lamentations? It's right after Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 3, starting at verse 22. If you're there, say amen. amen. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Amen? amen? Because His compassions fail not. Wow, what a promise. I don't think we fully understood that because we would have all said amen. amen. <laughs> His compassions fail not. They are new every week. Every morning. So I woke up this morning early. You know, 4.30 in the morning in California is still dark. And I have a built-in time clock. That's in my brain that wakes, ding, my eyes open up. And I looked outside the window, I said, man, it's daylight. <laughs> well, in California, it's still dark. And I knelt before my God, and I said, Lord, thank you for another morning that you've given me. So I want to thank God for his mercy. I want to thank God for his compassion, because his compassions fail not, and they are nude. Every morning, not just once a week, not just twice a week, but every single morning Amen. when you come boldly to the throne of grace, they're renewed. And you claim that promise. A month ago, or two months ago, uh, we went on a trip to the Philippines with my wife. My wife had some, um, some settlement, not not with the law, but with her families, we, uh, with property that the parents left her. And so, you know, that generation, my mother-in-law, my wife's mother and great-grandma, and grandma passed away. They left my wife with property. And it's here, you call it acres? Over there, they call it hectares. They don't even talk acres. And so uh, they, she had to settle this with her brother and her sister and her uncles. And what a mess. Because they got a lot of siblings, not siblings, but grandkids. And, and I told my wife, I, I'm staying out of it. I'm just going there to do evangelism. But prior to going to the Philippines, <clears throat> I sat with Christine, my daughter. And I said to her <clears throat> and my wife, three of us, I only have one daughter. And I told her, honey, you need to know where everything is. You need to know where our safe deposit box is. You need to know where our insurance plans is. You need to know where our cemetery lot is. You need to know everything that we have hidden from you in the past. Now you need to know where it is because we are flying to the Philippines. And this is when the time when that... 737 planes were going down. And, <clears throat> uh, you know, we said, we don't know how, what can happen to us. And I don't want my, my daughter to be in the, in the dark. If something was to happen to us, she knows where everything is. Insurance plan, safe deposit box, and the hidden cash that's hidden in the house. She needed to know, and the coins. We had it right in front of her, and she didn't even know it. It was in a bag used as a door stopper. It was really heavy. And she said, I never knew that. I said, yeah, there it is, all coins, quarters. 
So we need to tell her. I needed to tell her this. She needed to know that if something was to happen to mom and dad, she wouldn't have to be searching for things, not knowing what to do, because everything was there. Our will, our defense directive, everything was laid on the table for my daughter to know. I've, I've, been, I've seen situations where um, this couple was leaving to the GC back in, when was the last GC? General Conference. It was in, uh, was it, was it in San Antonio. Two couples were going on, road, on the road to the General Conference, and they were hit by a semi-truck. Both of them dead. Left two kids. And they didn't have anything planned. To get a cemetery plot and a service is a fortune. Who's going to pay that? And so I didn't want that to happen to Christine because, as I told you before, when my father passed away, he had everything planned. He was ready. And I wanted this to be ready for Christine as something was to happen to us. But the Lord, the Lord uh, used us in a mighty way, Ed. Mighty way. We were there for four weeks in the Philippines. And every Sabbath, the Lord had a, had a plan for me to speak at three different churches. Uh, two conference churches and one self-supporting church. The last Sabbath, we didn't have anything planned. So my wife asked me, where are we going to fellowship this Sabbath? I said, we're going to go an hour away from the town that we were staying into a... Uh, a church that is the main conference church in Davao City in the Philippines. My wife said, why, why, are we going, why are you going way down there? I said, because my father had connections to that church, and so I wanted to pay respect to some of the members that I knew that was there, so we decided to go. And we drove an hour away. We drove there, we got there, we were early, we sat in the pew, and we sat in the Sabbath school class. We were studying the lesson, the quarterly. And um, um, as we uh, started asking, the, uh, the, the teacher was asking questions about the lesson, and he asked me a question, and I answered in English. He looked at me, where are you from? <laughs> where are you from? I said, uh, from over there. And make long story short, he, he, we got to talking. And after the, after the lesson study, he came up to me after he talked with some gentleman in the back. And he came up to me and he says, uh, could you preach today? I said, what? Can you preach today? I said, really? I said, don't you have a speaker today? He says, yes, we do. But he's willing to step aside to give you the, the pulpit. What's the chances of going to a conference church and then them asking you to speak on that Sabbath morning. What's the chances that can happen? There's no way that can happen. But it is only because that morning, very early in the morning, you know, what does the Bible say? They are new every morning. I asked the Lord, Lord, use me to your honor and glory. Not knowing that he was going to use me to preach at this church the main conference church where the mission is, it's like going to La Sierra, Sue, and, and speaking at La Sierra a Church there in La Sierra. I said, what? I, I, was, I wasn't shocked. I was, just, I, I was just praising God. I said, wow, Lord, thank you. Yeah, could you speak? Sure, yes, praise God. Not knowing them, not knowing what they were asking for. Let me say that again. They didn't know what they were asking me to do because I was going to give a message that God gave me to give to them. Amen. I said, I was in the, the foyer just before coming up to the pulpit and all the elders came to me and shook my hand. Thank you for accepting. Thank you. Oh, you know, I started naming names who we knew and, and they're all smiling and, ha and, and, and praising God. I'm like, Lord, if they only knew what message they're going to hear today. <laughs> so I gave a message that morning. 
And it was a direct message that they, they probably, in fact, one of the young people came up to me at the end as they shook my hand outside. They said, we don't hear messages like that anymore. So I gave this message. And at the end of the, the meeting, people came out and shook my hand as they normally would. But I noticed none of the elders came to shake my hand. Or even the pastor. I was wondering, where are those guys? So I, after it was all said and done, I went back into the church. And when I went into the church, they were ner- they were ner- they were, I couldn't find them. They were not around. I, was, I thought that was strange. And then, and then no one came to invite us to Pavlak. My wife said, you know what you did? And I said, what? What did I do? You stepped all over their shoes. I said, no, I didn't. I was on the pulpit. (laughs) How could it have been? No one came to shake my hand. In fact, they were gone. I couldn't find where they were. Remember those guys that were shaking my hand before coming out on the stage? None were found, let alone invite us to potluck. But you know what? I, I, I was praising God the whole time I was there that Sabbath because even though we didn't get invited to potluck, I was, I was spiritually fed myself. Amen? Amen? I knew that God raised this occasion, that particular Sabbath, for me to give them a special message. And you know what the message? I'm going to share that this afternoon. But the reason why they needed to hear that message in particular was because they are involved with this. It's called kappa. And kappa is a, it's like getting involved in the stock market. And many of the church members are involved with this foolishness, even in leadership position that is rampant throughout the Philippines. It's called kappa. And it's investing in money and getting a big return. And many of them were involved in that. And for some reason, I didn't even mention the name Kappa. I just uh, named the idols that were in God's house. Could it be that many Adventists today have idols and that don't even know it? It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I was praising God because I was able to go in the afternoon to meet my uncle who's a Roman Catholic and he's, he's, he's about 89 years old, just, just surviving. Just, he's able to walk still, but you can see that he's deteriorating slowly. And my mission, my goal was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to him for the last time because I don't know when I'll see him again. I don't know how long he'll live. But I was to give him the message of mercy to him. You know, the Bible says in John 6, 37, him that cometh to me in no wise will I cast out. So I gave him the the Ten Commandments, the law of God, and how and why we should be keeping that law. Amen? Because all of us here this morning are, are going to be judged by that law. His son and his two daughters were there. And we were able to converse and we were able to pray. Uh, mind you, they were very serious in, in their, their religion. They're Roman Catholics. But we were, we were able to sit, uh, kneel down and pray and, and they accepted the literature I gave them. Amen? Amen? We need to tell everyone. We need to evangelize to everyone. Everyone you get a chance to, to talk to about the Lord is coming soon. Maranatha... We need to, to exclaim this message to them. I had this urgency. You know, uh, we were in our hotel. We are in our hotel, and it was during the, in, in the Philippines, it's called Passover, during Resurrection Week. And, you know, that's when they actually go out and perform the, the crucifixion of Christ. They have a guy hung on the cross. They put nails in his hand, and they, they whip him. And, and you know, God doesn't give us an example of that, but they, they're performing that. And so we're in our hotel, 
and the church was right below our hotel. And as the church was, be, uh, be, many Roman Catholics were lining up to go into the church. And I looked down and I told my wife, I'm going down there. Come, let's go. Let's go see what they're doing. So I went down from my hotel, went into their church, hundreds of people. And we sat in the back of the last seat in the, row, uh, in the, in the, in the church. And everybody was lining up. Most of one side, they were getting their Eucharist. They were performing the, the Mass. And the other line, people were uh, lined up to kiss the feet of Jesus. And as I, I sat there, and I, I'm thinking to myself, wow, these people are sincere. Would you say they're, they're sincere? Yes. yes. They're very sincere. And they believe that... Uh, what they're doing is, is, is going to earn them salvation. But they're sincerely wrong. And I was telling my wife, who's going to tell these people? Who's going to tell these people that they're sincerely wrong? You think the Mormons are going to do that? How about the Baptists? How about the Jehovah's Witness? Who? <laughs> God raised you and I. He raised you and I to give a special message to the world. And that's why I'm praying every morning, Lord, place it in my heart that I may be a witness to someone. We need to be a witness. So it is my prayer this morning that each of us may be a witness. Why? Why should I be a witness? Why should I be a witness? Because Jesus came to be a Savior to all of us. Christ is the only Savior. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning, we're going to look at Christ, the only Savior. There is none other. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians. Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Starting at verse 14. Well, let's go to 13 first. Are you there? Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his what? His blood. Even the forgiveness of sin. With just an added word of prayer, I'm going to kneel and just bow your heads as we seek the Lord in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, as we study your word this morning, Father, I pray that you give us clarity of mind, a discernment for spiritual things. Help us to understand what you have in store for us, that we may apply what we hear into our lives so that we may prepare for the soon great day when you come in the clouds of heaven. Be our invited guest this morning. Send your Holy Spirit now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In whom, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood and what? And forgiveness of sins. I'm reading from Maranatha, page 365. Christ is the only Savior. I like that. <laughs> Many people believe that the church will save you. Your religion will save you. Your house will save you. 
Your money will save you. Your doctrine is going to save you. I, I never understood that. You know, I, I grew up in the, in the conference all my life until I started to study for myself. Christ is the only Savior. And Ellen White tells us in Maranatha, page 365, she says, no matter who you are or what your life has been, you can be saved only in God's appointed way. <laughs> this is going to get good. I got, I got 30 minutes to present this. God's appointed way, not man's appointed way. There's only one way. You know, turn with me to Proverbs. Proverbs 16. If you're there, turn with me. Proverbs 16. 16. 25. Proverbs 16, 25. This is nothing new to you. This is just a review for all of us. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. There's only one way. One appointed way of being saved. How many of us want, want to be saved? <laughs> Amen. I want to be saved. I don't want to be deceived. I want to know what's God's way. And not am way or but God's way. Amen. There's only one way. And Ellen White tells us, and I, I'm, I'm sure you already know this, you must repent. What does repent mean? Re re mean? To turn away, right? To about face, to, to stop doing what you're doing. Repent. Let's confirm that. Go to Acts with me. Go, go to Acts with me. We're looking at Christ, the only Savior. Acts. Are you there? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Starting at verse 38. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be what? Baptize every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. Notice it's plural. And he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter is saying, We need to repent and be baptized. Baptized meaning what? Dying to self. Dying the death of sin. Hmm? In the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of our sins. What is sin? Okay, I don't need to explain that. But it says also, ye shall receive the what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, you ever wonder... Why some pastors are teaching these doctrines or some individuals are preaching this gospel, these winds of doctrines that are coming into the church. You wonder, why are they preaching these, these things and when they call themselves present truth? Why? Why is it? I don't understand it. They're not with the conference. They're self-supporting, but they're preaching a, another gospel. Why is it? Is it because maybe they don't have the Holy Spirit? Could it be? Because the Bible says in John 16, if the Spirit of truth comes, He will what? He will guide you into all truth. It didn't say some truth. Then you wonder, that's not truth. So why are they preaching this? Maybe it's because they're being led by another spirit. Could it be? Go to Acts chapter 3. You're there already at Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent, ye therefore, and what? And be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. You know, what goes together is repentance and conversion. See, the Holy Spirit leads you to, con to repentance. Christ, in, in, uh, in um, Acts chapter 
5, 5 verse 30. Let's look at it. Acts 5, chapter 5, verse 32. 31. Acts chapter 5, verse 31 says, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give what? Repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So Christ gives the power of the Holy Spirit for you to repent. And so when we repent, it leads you to conversion. As Peter is saying, repent ye therefore and be converted. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And I'm sure all of you had a, have a conversion testimony that you could share. How God had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have a testimony. How God has called you out. From darkness. The Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by their word of their testimony. Amen. You will have a story to tell. I have a story to tell. Amen. Born and raised in the Adventist church. <laughs> baptized at the age of 14. Because everybody else wanted to be baptized so that we could participate in the communion. That's the reason why I got baptized. Not because I gave my heart to the Lord and wanted to fully surrender. I didn't even understand all that until the year 2000 where God was calling me. He was wooing my heart, speaking to me. Then when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I gave up all those things Mind you, it didn't happen all at one, not one, one setting. He, the, ho the, the Holy Spirit started to take me from this point to this point to this point where I was surrendering things that I loved. <laughs> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I started to love the things that I used to hate, like reading my Bible. I started to put away things that I, I, you know, that I used to do that I, I knew was wrong, like, like drinking. I knew it was wrong. The Bible tells us we need to repent. You and I must fall helpless on the rock, Christ Jesus. He's our only Savior. People think, stay in the church. You know, you ever hear anyone say, uh, come to Christ, stay with Christ? They all say, stay with the church. You never hear them say, stay with Christ. Christ is the only Savior. Christ, Jesus. You and I must feel this need. You feel that need for Christ? Are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? I want to make this application simple this morning. It's not hard. You and I know the basics. But sometimes we need to go back to the basics because here was Nicodemus, thought he knew everything. And Christ had to give him the basics again. He said, you a scholar? And you don't know the basics? Could it be being in this church, we don't know the basics? <laughs> the simplicity of the Gospels, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is the only Savior. We need to fall on Jesus. You must feel the need for Jesus. He's the only one that is the remedy for sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The other morning, I share this quite often because this is a testimony that I give. <laughs> and this is what you and I are all battling with. Everyone's different here. 
I was telling Al, uh, Pastor Al that the devil has a, a snare for each of us. One can be different from me and Ed. Ed might have something that he doesn't have no problem with, but the devil is smart. He knows what is going to make us trip. And so this one morning, I, I was supposed to take my 10-minute break, and I ended up watching a surfing video on my break that went over 10 minutes. And finally, the Holy Spirit, hey, your break's over. I shut them on my phone off. I said, oh, I've got to go back to work. Wait, let me watch a little bit more. So I watched a little bit more and finally realized it was 30 minutes. And, I, I, and nobody knew. Al, Pastor Al, nobody knew. Nobody knew except the whole universe. Isn't that true? I, 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 I uh, shut my phone. I went back to work. Then I, as I started to go on the roof of the building, of the dental school building, Sue, the Holy Spirit convicted me. Pew! I said, oh, Lord, I failed miserably. I failed again. Mind you, the, the scripture said sins. It didn't, it didn't say singular. It's sins that we need to repent. And, and, and the Holy Spirit convicted me, and I said, Lord, I failed again. I, I failed again. And on that dental school roof, which was hot, I knelt down on that roof and I said, Lord, please forgive me. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Create in me a clean heart. And so I finished my job. I went back down and I, and I was passing this other building, and I, I just I felt the need to go up to this building to see this other, because I have a work order for that building. And I went, and there's a person that works in that building. She uh, is, a, is a member of our church there in Colton. And when I went up there, uh, I stopped in her office, and I started to talk to her. And, and as I started to talk to her, I told her exactly what happened to me, because she asked me, how's it going? I said, man, I'm warring. I'm warring against myself. I'm in warfare. This is who I'm battling with. I'm battling with myself. You know? But you can't do it by yourself. You cannot. It's impossible. I'm beginning to find that out. That when I try to do it on my own, I can't do it because I fail miserably. So I was telling her, I'm battling with, I'm, now I understand Ephesians chapter 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we're dealing with principalities. We're dealing with root, the, the, the spiritual darkness in this world, the, the rulers of the darkness. A special, uh, let me slow down. Spiritual wickedness in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world. This is who we're contending with. And I said, I, I need help. And I told her exactly what happened. She said, Eddie, you're not, you're, we're all in the same boat. I'm, I'm battling with that too. And here I thought, you know, uh, she, she was a faithful believer. She's struggling too. We're all struggling. We're warring. And Christ is the only answer. You and I must feel the need of Christ. And the, this, remedy, this remedy can be secured only by repentance towards God. And faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Only. That's our only hope. Surrendering to Christ. He said, Lord, please help me. Because if the devil has a snare for each of us this morning, then we need to know that we are secure, secured in Christ. Amen. Amen? She says this. The blood of Christ will avail for none but those who feel their need of its cleansing power. So if you don't feel the need of this cleansing power, then the, this, this salvation is, is, is none avail. Unless you know that you have this desire 
for cleansing. No matter what you, who you are, what your life has been, you can be saved only in God's appointed way. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. She says this, Christ was willing to undertake our redemption. He was willing to save all of us this morning. To take on our redemption by coming to this, to this sin-sick world. She also says, but our great physician requires of every soul unquestioning submission. That's the hard part. I have to submit. I have to surrender. I have to give all to Christ. You know that song that says, I surrender all? It didn't say, I surrender some. Did you hear that song? I surrender some? All to Jesus, I surrender some? No! All! Oh! I don't understand that. Do you? To surrender all? That means every part of your life is surrendered to Christ. Christ is the only Savior. I must surrender all. Christ, listen, Christ must have the entire management of will and action. Entire. Will and management. What is the will of God for us? According to the, to the word of God, it means, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, and this is the will of God, that you and I, I'm just adding that, are sanctified. Even our sanctification. That's what the Bible says. That we are to be made holy, sacred. Our management, our will, needs to be surrendered. Christ must have the entire management of will and action. Wow. You know, as I started to read that, I said, Lord, have, have I given all to you? <laughs> have I given, you know, you better not ask those questions, because if you haven't done it, it it'll come back as a rebuke. And I, I, I honestly, I, I had to kneel down before God. I said, Lord, I haven't given you all my will yet. I haven't fully surrendered, because I'm still hanging on to things. Now, to the worldling, it, it, what's wrong with that? My time has to be surrendered. My time. Our time needs to be surrendered. We may flatter ourselves that our moral character has been correct and we need not humble ourselves before God like the common sinner. But we must be content to enter into life in the very same way as the chief of sinners. Who was that chief of sinners? Paul. Wasn't it Paul said? He says... Uh, uh, what did he say? He said, um, uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy. First Timothy. Verse 15, where it says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus, did it say Christ Jesus? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? To save sinners of whom I am chief. The great apostle Paul is saying, I am the chief of sinners. You know, I, I am the chief of sinners. I fail miserably. Just because I stand before you doesn't make me some special person. Yes, I am special in God's sight, but I am no Different. We're all fighting the good fight of faith. We need to hold on to eternal life. 
It's a warfare. It's a challenge. And as I was telling this lady, this is what I'm warring against. I'm warring against myself. And Paul, the great apostle Paul says, who, of whom I am the chief. We may flatter ourselves just because we are in present truth circle doesn't mean we're safe if our hearts are not right with God. We, she says this, we must renounce our own righteousness. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm in present truth circle. I'm righteous. I know the truth. We don't teach this doctrine. We don't teach that doctrine. We got the right doctrine. We're safe. We keep the law of God. Oh, really? Really? You keep the law of God? You know, these doctrines that are coming into our church, and these are present truth people coming in, and they're sharing these, this, this doctrine. And I wonder, how is it that they believe that this is truth? And in their mindset, they believe it is the truth. And nothing but the truth. But you know, one, one, one quotation from Ellen White makes it so clear to me that these people that are pushing these doctrines, and it could be many, it's many, many out there. Get ready, because a new one will come to you. If it's not based to the law and to the testimony, if they don't speak it doesn't speak according to this word, there's what? No light in them. So Ellen White tells us in the thought, Thoughts of Months of Blessing, she says this, Obedience is the test of discipleship. It is the keeping of the commandments that proves our sincerity of our profession of love. When the doctrines we accept, here, come, here it comes now. When the doctrines we accept, you know these doctrines that are coming into our church, when you accept it, if it kills sin in the heart, purifies the soul from defilement, bears fruit unto holiness, then we may know it is the truth of God. Amen. Think about this, what I just said. When it kills sin, purifies the soul from defilement, bears fruit unto holiness, then we may know it is the truth of God. Could it be that these guys that are pushing these doctrines, because you and I know it's not the truth of God, but they believe that it is the truth of God, it is maybe because maybe the Holy Spirit is not convicting them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment? Could it be that another spirit is leading them? Could it be? Because it says, when benevolence, tenderheartedness, sympathy, kindness is manifested in the lives, she says, then, and the joy, the joy of right doing is in the heart, when we exalt Christ and not self, then we may know that our faith is of the right order. I'm going to go into that later on this morning uh, in our second service. But we must renounce our own righteousness and then plead for the righteousness of Christ. I'm pleading every morning for this righteousness. How about you? I have to. I have to. I want it. I need it. I have to have it. Because the moment I slack off with Christ, the devil's right there. Amen. He's right there. He's ready. He's ready to pounce on you, to take charge of you. I have to learn how to die to myself. Amen? Amen? We all are facing these 
these, uh, these obstacles this morning. Self, she says, self must die. We must depend wholly upon Christ for our strength. Christ is the only Savior. He's our only Savior. Self must die. We must acknowledge that all we have is from the exceeding riches of divine grace. It is because of His mercies that we are not consumed. Because His compassions fail not. They are renewed every morning. No matter who you are or what you have been, Christ is the only answer. You and I must repent. As Peter said, repent and be baptized. Repent and be converted. Turn away. No one knows what you do but the whole universe. I was telling the young people in the Steps to Life uh, a camp meeting, and, you know, all the kids have cell phones now. Okay? I, I, I told the young people, you know, the devil has a plan for you. Just when you think you're, you're I'm young, nothing's going to happen. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not exempted. Young people are being, are being attacked. And I told them about the, their cell phones. And I said, the Bible says that, you know, in Psalms 101, verse 3, it says, uh, to, I will set no wicked thing in front of my eyes. And I, I was giving them an, an example on their phones. I said, you know what? Sometimes the devil will pop up certain things on your phone. And then nobody's, nobody's around. Let me see what, what this is. I said, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, but nobody's watching. And it's so easy. You just go, Psh! and then you're in captivity. The devil knows how to entrap you. And you know the kids? They all got quiet. They knew exactly what I was talking about. Because it happens to us adults. And the devil has a snare for each of us. Listen, my friends. I didn't realize the time is going. We must acknowledge. We must acknowledge that Christ is the only Savior. Amen. No matter who you, who you are and what your life has been, you can be only saved by God's appointed way. And this appointed way is surrendering all to Jesus Christ. You know what, my friends? You and I know that. We know that. That we have to surrender it all to Christ. Amen. What we need to ask the Lord is say, Lord, place it in my heart that I can surrender. Because, you know, we can't do it. Amen. There's no way we can do it. Even if it means to sacrifice the things that we love. And I know, you know, I can go with many examples of the things that we love when it comes to food, the things that we grew up with, that we've done the, our whole life, and now I have to give it up. Turn with me in my closing text. Colossians. Go back to our opening text. Colossians. Colossians. Verse, chapter 1, verse 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. Darkness is going to come to cover this whole world. You know that in Isaiah chapter 50, 60. Darkness is coming. And if we are not covered by Christ, because Christ said, he who has delivered us from the power of darkness. And you know what? Darkness is going to cover the whole and blanket the whole world. But Christ is going to deliver us. Who, and what does the scripture say? And has tra translated us into the kingdom of dear son. Look at verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. What does the Bible say? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. We have redemption through His blood. 
even the forgiveness of sin. Darkness is coming upon this world. We have to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior this morning. You know this. This is just a review today for our Sabbath school. Christ is our only Savior this morning. As we study, as we go into the next service, we're going to culminate what it means to have this light, to have this, this redemption power, that we can have this, what God has given to us in His promises of His Word. We need to go back to the basics. We need to go, as Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Oh, I, I've been baptized. Oh, no, no. Every day we have to be born again. We have to fully surrender every day. And that's why when we traveled to the Philippines, I told Christine everything that she needed to know. Why? Because I have to make sure in my spiritual life that I am right with God. How many of you know that you will live tomorrow? We don't know. It is only by His compassion. It is by His mercy. It is by His grace that His compassions fail not. This morning, I want to make an appeal to you this morning. How many of you want to recommit your life to the Lord? Amen. Amen. So this is just the beginning of our, our study. We're going to it in our second service. We're going to go, in, go into it a little bit deeper. And I, I'm, it's going, I'm going to show what is required of this to be Jesus our Savior. There's going to be five points to it. And that way we can apply it, uh, apply it in a basic way so that we can fully understand what, is, what, we, what we need to do to prepare our hearts and our lives for him. So let us pray as we seek the Lord in prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege you've given us, Lord, to study your words. It's very simple, the simplicity of the gospel. We need to look to Jesus as our author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we, we go, we're going through struggles in our lives. You know, we're warring with self. We're warring against the devil. But you've made a, a promise to us, Lord, that you will give us salvation. And salvation is only through Jesus Christ by confessing our sins. As the Bible says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I pray that you will continue to work in each heart of ours Surrender, that we can surrender fully to you. Break up that, that, that hardened heart of ours, that stubborn heart, that rebellious heart of ours. Whatever it might be that is in contrary to your will, I pray that you will remove it from us this morning. You saw every hand that went up. I pray, Lord, for each one and their families. Continue to bless each one today as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.